dedicated book. Yes. I'll tell Doris. Yes. <laughs> So thanks for doing a little interview with me, Mom. Um, <laughs> What's more fun? <laughs> I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, my, you know, what you remember of our, my, Max and I's uh, work on anti-big tobacco stuff, mm -hmm. and then also talk about your work, which is so inspiring. So um, I wanted to start out with the story of how you became an activist. Ah, <laughs> me, myself, and I. Yes. Uh, 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 well, I have a, a quick story, um, and I trace it to second or third grade when I had all my school supplies out, and I was l so excited, and I was looking at them, and I saw this little tiny box of Denison reinforcements, those little circles that go on the lined paper, and I opened it up, I said, wow, but there couldn't be a hundred of them. And there were, you know, it was like short seven or something. And all my mom said was, why don't you write a letter? So, of course, I wrote a letter to whoever makes Denison reinforcements. And um, they sent me a case with an actual letter of apology. <laughs> oh, this poor little girl is going to think we're real liars. And... And I think that put me on a trajectory of, you know, when I saw something wrong, when less more when I, I had problems, and these are pretty pathetic pet peeves, but <laughs> I remember I worked at a camp and the director who was Donald Seahawk, the best name ever, and he was not allowed in any of the board meetings when they were talking about the camp. And I was saying, and it was a defense department camp. So I wrote a letter, because I was a, a, a camp counselor, to all these generals saying, how can you talk about camp policy and not have Seahawk there? And I got them to change the policy. So it sort of just became what I regard we all should just basically be mouths and, and, and try to go to people who have power to decide. Mm -hmm. and, Again, it's really not a big systems change, but it's to develop that habit that we're not bystanders and at least victims. Um, and so from that, I, um, I, was, I, I was involved with migrant farm workers in Florida when I was in college and was just appalled at Grapes of Wrath in the Minute Maid orange fields and uh, orange groves and I started a sort of recreation a reading program for a hundred migrant farmer her children and I remember distinctly and this is again about a hundred years ago that <laughs> only of the hundred children only three had dreams and mm. we're talking nine ten eleven year olds mm. one wanted to work at Burger King another wanted to go in the army and I can't remember the other but that was the extent of their dream. Everybody else said, I'm going to pick just like my, my dad, my mom. And it was such a cycle of poverty I was horrified by. And I was so excited by, the, by a, a boycott against um, Minute Maid orange juice for unionization that I said, that's the kind of collective bargaining power. And so I ended up being a community organizer for Chavez and the United Farm Workers for three years really just mobilizing public support for the boycott. At that point, it wasn't oranges, it was, that was a successful threat in boycott that resulted in a union contract, amazing. But um, I worked on the lettuce boycott uh, for three years and just learned a lot about engaging all sectors of society to demand rights of people they don't have any relation to except for those people happen to be providing the fruits and vegetables at our table. And, and then I became a reporter and covered Congress for a bunch of years. Um, and I was just, I was just um, amazed at how there were not ordinary people in the halls of Congress. Sure, they were there, but to, I remember one case of a mother who testified against Nestle's infant formula that lacked the key vitamins and nutrients uh, and sort of like how, how dare they 
thank goodness she, she was one of the witnesses allowed to testify, which helped really require controls over um, um, this industry that was making lots of money um, with a very bad product. And it just made me very cynical of Congress, and it's gotten far worse from in the 70s, where big money, big special interests, um, really do, I think, commandeer everything that happens, with a, just a, a handful of exceptions, where you have grassroots, ordinary folks who can really amass the kind of collective clout that's necessary. So out of that long-winded story, which um, is that I, I kept believing that we talk about college students. They're the change makers. They'll, they'll push, push the envelope. And I, I just kept feeling that if younger people, uh, before their voting age, got involved, it would be a habit of life, that at least they would become more, not just observers, not just spectators, but real participants um, in any level of policy. And obviously local is easier. So when we were driving to a soccer game when you were in second grade, there was uh, just a, that the county council was going to have a hearing on cigarette vending machines. And I don't, I don't remember hearing it, but you heard it. And um, we didn't talk much about it, but you definitely had grown up as part of the Surgeon General Everett Coop's tobacco-free class of 2000. Smoke-free class of 2000. Right, yeah. smoke-free class of 2000. And you were sort of primed, so when you heard this, I think you connected some connection. you made some connections, and the next day, I'm pretty sure you said, well, you know, I, I think I'd like to try to buy cigarettes from vending machines at different places, and... And, of course, well, that sounds great. <laughs> Go for it. And, and then, you know, what, what turned out to be a, a lovely long-term fight against big tobacco and their marketing pra practices to young people. Um, and, of course, one of the problems we have is just seeing it as a teen smoking problem, as a child smoking problem, rather than a societal mm -hmm. smoking issue. But in any case... That all sort of is the backdrop to um, Youth Activism Project and to the initial steps of your getting involved. Um, well, yeah, that that uh, that leads in well. <laughs> uh, actually, before before we get get to to our stuff, um, I was wondering how supportive your parents were. Of, of your attitude towards, you know, seeing something wrong and, and wanting to voice it. Um, and it sounds like, you know, that initial push to, with the re Denison reinforcements was definitely mom-inspired, but I was wondering how much they continued to encourage your work with Cesar mm -hmm. Chavez and, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think they would have been happier if I had sort of remained mainstream. I think... By they, my parents struggled a lot with my older sister, and she was a fierce opponent of the Vietnam War. And at the time, our dad was in the State Department and uh, was very much um, taking the line that domino effect, and we had to stay the course in Vietnam. So there was tremendous. Uh, there was real, there was a war within our house. So my, my sister took those battles. Um, the civil rights, um, I remember very clearly, again, my mom, our mom, being showing like footage of the police and dogs and hoses in Selma and showing that video footage to other women. And I remember, I was quite young, but I remember saying, wow, I sort of don't get the sense that this is um, quite acceptable uh, mm -hmm. and that she was sort of going out in a, on a limb, even though she wasn't someone who, who was very public. But I think she had a pretty strong sense of right and wrong. And 
Another piece to all of this was my father and many of his colleagues um, survived, um, and some did not, the McCarthy era. And there was an, a, a, a very insidious practice of this kind of um, um, uh, really, uh, really going after people without, without anything <coughs> other than innuendo. <coughs> Sorry. Absolutely. Uh, that's chilly again, right? Hyper this time. Oh. oh. Sorry. Oh. Go on. So the McCarthy era was another um, really historic benchmark for our family, and many of my father's friends and colleagues got completely decimated from it, lost their jobs, lost their homes. I mean, it, it, it was a real uh, tsunami. And so there was this interesting mix of questioning the government, being loyal to the government, uh, that whole melange. So there was a very, I would say, fairly decent um, appreciation for the need to challenge, even if one was wrong. And so with um, my working with Cesar Chavez, I think they probably were really um, shocked, somewhat appalled. Um, they were not anti-union, but they certainly were not pro-union. And... Uh, I think they just respected my um, effort, and, and I always felt that, uh, and I still feel it today. And I hope that was one of the things that we, uh, Matthew and I, have been able to pass along, you know, is that sense of, of curiosity and challenge um, the status quo. Sorry. They both go upstairs. They both go <laughs> so uh, yeah, absolutely. You guys encouraged us. That's the that is definitely the reason I asked the question because <laughs> um, yeah, we wouldn't have been nearly as effective or successful had not been for all of your um, you know moral uh, and editing support. <laughs> right. Well. <laughs> and and driving, you know. Yeah, I think a lot of it. All that I, kind of I stuff. often say parents and other adults need to grow a third ear because we, we tend to what it is we want to hear and what we're conditioned to hearing. And if you just allow yourself to hopefully try to hear, you don't have to understand it or accept it, mm -hmm. but to try to listen. And it's really, it's something we're not trained to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Um, all right, so... So let, let's let's uh, let's knock out the little a little more history on Lesko Brothers. You you talked about how we first started, which is pretty much how I remember it as well. Um, being in the car and hearing a hearing, a hearing that there was going to be a hearing, and then we decided to do some sting operations. And uh, I was wondering if you could just share a little more of the history from that point forward, and some of the highlights and and interesting moments for you. Uh huh. Well. Uh... Uh, one of the things that I remember so vividly is when you all chose your targets um, and where you could do this civil disobedience. Um, I, 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 um, Pop, should we save this for later? Should we save uh, the rest of this? Oh, either way. You sure? All right. 
Uh, well, one of my vivid memories is when you were choosing your targets for trying to buy cigarettes illegally. Um, you know, I we you'd scope out the area, and by that that time, I'm sure you were four feet, and Max, you know, was this little you know kindergartner, and you assumed the world would stop, the police would come. Um, you'd probably be arrested. I mean, there was no question that this was high stakes. And I always would go, like, into the big boy's restaurant. I'd go, like, to the back. And I, so I could see you, but I was clearly not with you. And I remember the first machine you put in the quarters, and every quarter, again, it was as though you were robbing a bank, and all the cameras were on you. And if I recall correctly, you were a little afraid to pull the lever, yeah. and you left that to Max, <laughs> the kindergartner. Um, and you know, and he pulled it, and then I would come with my little this thing called a Polaroid camera <laughs> and snap a picture of you normally holding a Marlboro or a Camel pack um, in front of the machine, and then. Um, you you did that at a grocery store, bowling alley, and a family restaurant to show that even in these family youth oriented venues, that um, it was this little sign saying you must be eighteen to buy was completely bogus, and you were proving that the law was ineffective and that um, these machines just should be gone. And and so I do remember that. My role, I believe, as a parent, as a supporter, as an ally, was simply to help remind you that uh, the hearing was happening, that you should write your testimony because you needed to give your testimony um, in writing. And, mm -hmm. and I think it had to be um, you know, given to the county council a day before the hearing, or, or there's some technicality with all school boards and all of that, and you just want to follow the rules so they don't disqualify you from testifying. And I do remember sort of, you know, because you were working with your, with Max, your brother, you know, there was a little dynamic, uh, and just suggesting that you just tell the story mm -hmm. and not get, and so it was trying not to do it for you, trying to stay out of your way, and yet help you time it, um, help you practice it. Mm -hmm. Not help you, but have you practice yeah, it. Yeah, I remember reading, rereading that. And timing mm -hmm. it and checking words. Mm -hmm. and um, But I think the, the toughest thing for an adult is not to take over. Yeah. And the best thing is if it's authentic and in your own voice. And I think ultimately that did really happen yeah. in when this I, case. Right, when I reread the... Especially the, the the first testimony we have on our wall. When I read every time I reread read that, I'm amazed at how you know what a nine year old voice it's 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 exactly. it maintains. That's right. Yeah, and and you know there was no question that with a poster, the handmade poster, again authentic, not not fancy kinko stuff. You know, it was clearly yours. You owned it. It was yours. Um, that had tremendous bearing, but your evidence. I mean, yeah. if you had just gone in with stats, uh-uh, yeah. you know, oh, you're just yeah. put up to it by the lung, lung and cancer and all those groups, all the predictable advocates. But you had done it, you could make your case, and that was very effective. And, um, and so you got beyond what I call the cute factor. That existed, you exploited it, not intentionally, but by <laughs> virtue of your young age. Mm -hmm. But you had the clout with the information that you were conveying, and that is essential. And Bruce Barriano, who remains a, one of the highest paid lobbyists in the state of Maryland, who has been a convicted felon for, um, for uh, sort of uh, campaign finance um, uh, violations, he was at the hearing, and he definitely was your adversary and made a lot of difference to have such a, a perfect evil contender. I mean, it was great. And, and he definitely said, you know, oh, their mom put them up to this. And I mean, the kind of smear stuff that, that is so typical. Um, and it was great, though, because 
you know, the tobacco industry is is a great enough enemy, but to have Barriano as the symbol, Bruce Barriano. He was Barriano, a good face to it. Yeah. yeah, and he was this sort of short guy who just was, he was mean. He is really mean. was, yeah. And he, and, and you could tell he bought politicians, particularly when, you were triumphant at the at the county council in getting an ordinance, and you it was the first time the chair of the county council, Bruce Adams, had special pens made for the signing ceremony with the ordinance number and gave those pens to you and Max, and another great advocate, Marcia Marks. That was the first time on any ordinance that that had ever been done before. Mm. That was a new precedent. And uh, so that bill took effect, uh, but as you've reminded me, Bruce Barriano and the tobacco industry sought a statewide preemption of the county ban, and so that took you for many years to the state house, and you could definitely see Bruce Barriano truly single-handedly had so much power because of campaign finance dollars that, unlike at the county council, he really could control the votes in those mm. committees. And um, that legislation took years to move through. And then other legislation that your younger brother and you to a certain degree were involved with was um, how the tobacco um, industry um, allegedly would make sure that their products, chew and tobacco, were placed in very easy areas for anyone to see and possibly steal mm -hmm. near school supplies and candy, uh, very accessible and uh, again through a sting operation that um, in your high school years where you showed how easy it would be to shoplift an empty case of, Mar uh, an empty pack of Marlboro showing how the store clerks wouldn't know and that led to an ordinance be passed by the same county council to put all tobacco products behind the counter for not just youth, but for everyone. It was just, so it has become more of a forbidden fruit, whether that's good or bad public policy. I tend to think it's the right direction. Um, but, and then you also were asked um, by your state delegate um, to help with a tax on smokeless tobacco. Mm -hmm. and, and at the time, this is Chris Van Hollen, who is now a high level member of the House of Representatives, uh, but he really felt that you all could move the legislature, the tax committees, in ways that no one else could. And again, Bruce Barriano and his fellow cronies were able to, um, you know, again, defeat any tax increase. But it was very interesting how uh, senior politicians really viewed the power of young people to have that unique influence. And there's no guarantee, but it's really, we need much more of that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe in lowering the voting age. Um, and we, you know, to just engage, to reduce the barriers. We already have such low engagement mm -hmm. in politics in terms of our voter turnout, mm -hmm. even in good years, so mm -hmm. to speak. And we need more young people, um, leading fights and, and, and changing the way our system is run. Well, thanks. I wasn't, um, I wasn't going to bring up Bruce Barriano, but since you did, I, I was wondering if you could maybe um, uh, try to recall that one little uh, confrontation in a stairwell in the State House that I vaguely remember, where he, he approached, uh, I guess, all of us in the stairwell pretty much. Yes. I... Um, it was a very interesting experience for me because I could tell I became not Wendy Schatzelesko, but the mother of Max and Morgan. I, he, when he accused you all of manipulating uh, information, distorting things, um, representing the tobacco industry in the way you did, lying about it. And that personal attack on both of you, and I think he also had some 
some comment about your mother puts you up to this or your parents put you up to it. I assume so. And but it wasn't about me. It was that he was attacking you, the two of you, mm -hmm. and I became somebody I did not know. And it was very important that I, I get away from there. And I remember Matthew sort of, you know, helped me just get away because <laughs> it escalated very quickly and I am not a confrontational type and and it was, he was so ugly, and he, and he did it because he knows how to get to people. Yeah. I mean, that it, was the part I really remember. I mean, how manipulative he, I felt he was, was trying to intimidate the two of you, yeah. and I think, if anything, it strengthened your resolve. Yeah. yeah. It only reinforced everything mm. that you'd been doing all yeah. those years and mm. saying, I want to do more. <laughs> and maybe it's made you. Um, um, much more fearless yeah. as a result. Because yeah. Yeah. that was very visceral yeah, and yeah. very real. Yeah. Well, thanks for <laughs> taking that trip down memory lane. <laughs> um, I wanted to go to some more broad questions. Um, uh, what do you? What role do you think you you answered this a little bit uh, in in just how much people need to participate instead of be innocent bystanders or um, spectators? Yeah, or spectators, cynics, or yeah. you know, just complainers. Yeah, um, but what role does activism play in a democracy? Do you think? <sighs> It seems absolutely essential. I, I, activism, uh, if we don't have it, we don't have a real debate. Uh, we don't, uh, I mean, we, we need to um, energize dissent. Uh, it's in order to have a robust uh, conversation about every single issue, we need all sides to be involved. And, on a very simple sort of equation, I really feel that pretty much you could say every proposed policy impacts everyone, including children and youth. Mm -hmm. But at least policies that directly impact children and youth right now, the number of school days, standardized testing, um, uh, uh, virtually you know, all those issues, child health access, mm -hmm. um, voting rights. Uh, young people, there should be like a youth impact statement with some kind of mechanism that really does have to seek out the range of views, not mm -hmm. the monolithic youth mm -hmm. voice that mm -hmm. doesn't exist. Right. But to almost have to have, like you have environmental impact statements, you have fiscal notes. So why can't we make sure we get some kind of barometer on the range of views by young people on legislation? Um, I mean, we could talk about you know, drunk driving and graduated licensing, um, a lot of those issues that clearly impact. But young people are never asked. And sometimes you get sort of adult clones who go up there and you know, take one road. Well, that's fine. I, I, that's great. But let's just make sure we are engaging young people who are not your star students and your, and your sort of ambassadors that the adult world normally wants to walk out and, mm -hmm. and sort of be the, the voices for supporting legislation that often um, really, really doesn't allow young people to to grow up and, mm -hmm. and choose their own destiny mm -hmm. to the same degree that I believe. At least we should have that debate. They may lose out, mm -hmm. but it should be... So social studies classes, there's a new um, program for middle school students called iCivics, uh, which is an uh, animated um, game about legislative process and special interest groups. It was uh, the brainchild of Sandra Day O'Connor so one of the examples they have is Saturday mail del delivery service. Okay, so I'm saying, why would you ever choose an issue that would definitely not make anyone care at all? <laughs> I mean, mail, 
Saturday delivery. I mean, come on, come on. <laughs> this is 2010, you know? And, you know, can we please make sure civics classes, state and local government, um, at least our social studies classes are engaging, yes, in some really important historical issues, but also some real world right now debates that are going on. And young people should at least, it should be on their radar screen and there should be many more vehicles for alerting young people to the DREAM Act and other, and very, and small bills at the mm -hmm. local level, mm -hmm. at, the, at the state level uh, that are going through and they should not be allowed to pass legislation until they've at least really gotten, uh, at least solicited X number of, mm -hmm. of points of view. And that, of course, can always be manipulated, but at least to yeah. have some mechanism, mm -hmm. like an environmental impact statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what, what percentage of the country is below the voting age? I think it's about 26%. Uh, so a quarter of the population and 100% of the future, of course. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Um, so for, for people who haven't, been raised by, you know, uh, inspiring parents like mine, <laughs> what, are, what are some of the easiest ways uh, or more net, most natural or most approachable ways for, for people to get started um, in, in some form of activism? That's a great question. Uh, I, I think it's what, if you have a great idea, small idea, big idea, whatever, if you are outraged about an injustice, um, I think the first thing is to make sure there is no, nothing, no policy, no proposal that is moving down the train tracks. Uh, because what you don't want is to be working over here like on, let's say, police harassment. And meanwhile, there may be legislation, good or bad, dealing with that. And you could, you could not be part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. So you do both. You, you work on your own proposal, what you believe, but it may be really important to check what's going on with your city council on police regulations in this example, um, or at the state level particularly, just because it's much easier to affect change at local and state level, not mm -hmm. at the federal. Um, and it's just much easier usually to stop proposals than to move them forward. And um, so that, I think, I mean, now that we have internet, it's a lot easier than calling, you know, some clerk at your city council. Are there any bills dealing with the police or whatever issue? And, you know, within literally, if you invest 20 minutes, you're going to be able to maybe get a sense of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And from there, you at least can perhaps figure out what organizations uh, pro and con are involved. The main thing is that the pity is not to figure out who who has the power to decide. Because if you're only talking about it with your own peer group, that's a great first exercise. But I really believe there needs to be both peer education as well as educating our policymakers. Mm -hmm. And it's most young people by the adult world are encouraged only to be peer educators. That's how you're most influential. Talk to your peers. You know they listen to you and younger peers. And they almost, I really believe, it's what's most comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, it's to keep our age-segregated society mm -hmm. um, intact. And it makes everybody feel good uh, because young people um, are usually most comfortable with their peer group. That's how we are in the U.S. of A. And of course, with younger peers, they really do exert a fair amount of influence as role models. And But to get out of that silo and make sure that we're legicating, you're advocating um, with, with powers that be, what's tough is they don't pay attention. And you have to prove you're serious, just like you had to prove you were there for the long fight because almost every fight is not um, uh, a semester, um, a session, a legislative session. It is usually many years 
Um, as you can see, for instance, with DREAM Act, um, it's been around since 2000 when it was first introduced in Congress. Ten years later, and we may, you know, yes, there's steady progress, but goodness, these things take long. But um, I think, um, you know, the main thing is also if you're trying to change policies within your own public school, uh, it's I would always recommend that you try to work with some students at another school mm. and you take it a more system-wide approach because normally if you go against your own principle, it's an automatic sort of autocratic shutdown and most principles will take it personally. Whereas if you're saying we want vegetarian food in all, in all school cafeterias, we don't uh, want to have the, the soda industry um, basically bribing our school officials um, with their uh, shit that they sell, whatever. Um, if you're going against your own school, you get shut down. That's why you need to go to, again, the higher power B, and that's usually your school board. And... Um, and what's very important with all of this and what your generation and even the younger generation is especially adept at is how to do YouTubes, how to get the word out, how to get the word out through social media and, and the non-mainstream media, but then how also not to forget that school board members, local policymakers, they read those community newspapers that you would never look at. They read the daily newspapers that, that most people may read maybe online a couple headlines, but no, it's not in your universe, but it's how you gain access and sh shine the spotlight on decision makers because what happens is then that reporter, if he or she is, is doing his or her job, will say, well, these students are demanding X. What do you think? What is your response? So you get them on the record. Mm -hmm. So it's a way, even if they shun you as an activist or ideal group of activists, the, the media, the mainstream media, sometimes can get, um, can extract from them a position and then you can continue to rework that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's making sure you... You exploit your unique influence because to turn the paternalism when you often will get um, the typical, it's so great to see young people engaged and involved and we're so glad you came forward and gave us your point of view and go away. I mean, <laughs> and, you know, that's pretty much where it all starts. And then you need to show your persistence mm -hmm. and your creativity and some, some guerrilla uh, activism where it's rallies, it's protests, it's, if necessary, ways to get their attention, um, and then to use the media, to engage the media in helping you get your side of the story out that, again, can pressure, as long as it's out there as a public issue, it's much easier to force the hand of decision makers to at least uh, interact and engage mm -hmm. with you um, and to prove that you're there, you're not going to go away mm -hmm. and you're angry mm -hmm. and or you're excited and they're yeah. shunning the future generation, which is how you can guilt them, I think, mm -hmm. by saying, yeah. you know, what are you, you know, if you don't pay attention to us, what what is that telling us? Mm -hmm. That we don't count, we know that, mm -hmm. um, but also our ideas don't count and you're turning off the faucet of innovation and social justice for the future if you're telling us to go away. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, you have pretty wide-ranging interests um, as far as policy and activist um, movements. Uh, in, in a lot of your work with your organization called the Youth Activism Project, uh, you've written about activists, youth activists on a wide range of issues. And you're also very passionate about a lot of a lot of issues in, in daily political life. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if uh, there were any issues right now in the you know new year of 2011. Uh, if there was any, if if 
uh, especially, uh, I, I guess I'm feeling like the progressive movement has really bumped it, its activism, um, at least online. <laughs> you know, with, with moveon.org and, and the internet, I feel there's a lot more overlap between progressive movements. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel that in the coming years, we're going to be most effective when we can you know, rally all of those different people from those di who focus on different movements, but can rally as each issue comes to the public discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if there were any one or two issues that you thought are most urgent uh, in this next year or two. Um, that that if you know if, mm -hmm. if if given the opportunity you think it, it's worth uh, devoting some some energy towards. That is. I, I know it's an such, unfair question. It's but. a really <laughs> tough question because um, I I think there's some systemic changes like the need to curtail um, corporations as having the same rights of individuals and their incredibly powerful. Um, impact, particularly at the federal level, um, and also in the state legislatures and campaign finance reform, I don't believe has a shot in the next year or two. I, uh, we've lost Russ, Russ Feingold, from, the senator from Wisconsin, um, who has been really the, the key architect of that, and with the Roberts Court, um, that seems to be a watershed issue that that opens up so many other issues. Right. And I, I don't, I'm not sure to what degree the online community is focused on campaign finance reform mm -hmm. for good reason. Yeah. Um, it tends to be a, a movement that Common Cause and some of the older organizations have been champions for 20 years, 20, 30 years. And it definitely needs to be co-opted and taken over by mm -hmm. young people. Um, that this is instead what we're getting are some efforts for more bipartisan stuff, and mm -hmm. and I just think that is wrong. I think um, <laughs> we don't need to dilute differences. We need to have a much clearer sense of who is standing for what. There, I would say, in looking at the last decade, the. Um, Gay, gay rights movement has probably done, had the most victories, and this was even, mm -hmm. I would say that even before the, finally the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that everyone should look at their movement mm -hmm. um, and how um, they have engaged all, many sectors, um, many straight folks, uh, and, and I think their combination of an online um, and e-advocacy and face-to-face -face and their, lo I mean, again, a 10-year battle for one provision in the military appropriations. I mean, it shouldn't even be a big issue, right? It should be war and what we're spending on war, but this is sort of the, um, so I think that is a great study in, in looking at effective campaigns, but I, I think our war machine is, and, and what we are doing overseas, um, you know, I, I read Nicholas Kristof, one of, what, someone from the New York Times I really like to read because I'm very engaged and passionate about some foreign policy issues, says the, we have more people in our military marching bands than we do in the diplomatic foreign service. Wow. Hello. <laughs> what is that? So we keep our troops happy with music, okay, but we have, you know, regardless what you think of foreign service, but we need more diplomacy than a military machine. I would say that is one of the huge issues. After the Cold War, we were supposed to have a peace dividend. Obama has increased our military budget by 5%. Um, there is something very wrong with what we're doing in America. So that would probably be, oh, I, I need to think a lot more because I'm so upset oh, it's a, it's an <laughs> about unfair the future. Question, but, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, I think we, we largely agree um, that, that, um, that the war is the most urgent issue and that campaign finance reform is quite possibly the largest linchpin 
which would unlock options for all the other movements that we find important. But I do think if you look at Amnesty International and so many other groups, Change.org, what you do see is, as you've described, this, this wonderful cross-pollination yeah. so that, because it's so easy to get in your own mm -hmm. area and you need to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anything, mm -hmm. if you look, one great group is Advocates for Youth that work on reproductive rights. And I just think it's, it, that's another great advocacy organization. And, you know, there they have, they, they really have issues that they work on. They've been trying to kill abstinence-only education for now about two decades. They're getting closer. Five, can you believe this? Two decades to <laughs> kill that. And, um, but what's great is you see um, with their online blog, Amplify, and their social network, and uh, the One Campaign, you just see all these groups that there is all of this exchange through common space, common areas like change.org, and there are going to be lots more things like that that will be invented. Yeah. So there is hope, but at the same time, I, and this is showing my age, there is an awful lot of romance about the sort of instant advocacy. Mm -hmm. You add your name to a petition and um, and as we know, at least in, in a lot of, if those are directed to policymakers, many of them have spam filters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Or if they go anywhere, sometimes with the right media advocacy connection, they can really, again, sort of right. get that public voice. Right. Um, and, you know, posting on politicians' Facebook walls and, and um, Twitter and all those, those are great tools, but um, I still would say that they go, they are tools and not a complete substitute for the kind of face-to-face, um, -face, even if it's via Skype, mm -hmm. uh, where we are really talking and... Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm engaging and we aren't just a virtual network mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it it we remain in our grassroots activism we need to continue to be really people to people mm -hmm. as hokey as that sounds but i and i think i think all of that is still happening i yeah. just think it it's very easy to do these shortcuts and these um it's sort of bumper sticker activism yeah. and it, it's it we won't win that way yeah absolutely uh, yeah, those are really great points. Um, that the online stuff seems to be maybe a nice way for people who aren't used to doing anything yes. to start doing something. But then the next step is definitely making the phone calls. Just call your representative, tell them how you feel, or, right. you know, start writing letters, you know. And, right. and if you're, you can get to DC, go talk to them, and at the state level, go right. talk to them. Right. And even you know, this whole idea that you have to be in DC. I mean, I would just say. Um, if you get, if there's an issue you care about, uh, most of these politicians hold town meetings during recesses. Mm -hmm. And so that's a Good time yeah. where, you know, it's probably places you don't frequent, like the city hall or whatever, <laughs> but you know, they have these forums at senior citizen centers. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an ideal place to yeah. go. Uh, carry a sign, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you often can't do that if you go to the state house. Yeah, you know they yeah. they'll prevent you from doing so many things. Uh, but you you know you have to just do a little surveillance mm -hmm. of your 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 own elected officials. Mm -hmm. And you're right though about um, how hard is it to make a phone call? Yeah. And you know unfortunately you will not be quizzed. Right. I mean yeah. it is more. But what's important to say is where you are, volunteer your name, where you live. It can just say, you know, you're from Kansas City. Yeah. That's okay. That, they just know you're in their district yeah. or you're in their state. That's all they need right. to know. And that you are a real constituent. Yeah. And you are an engaged constituent who will vote for or against you when it comes up for election. Yeah. The other is in our, in our texting mode, um, of course, um, Twitter is, 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 I think, really fundamentally terrific to, to engage in, but also something called handwritten letters. They, time and time again, 
those get mm. pulled out mm. um, from from astroturf mail from the form letters all of us sign mm. a couple a week probably for this or that legislation or issue um, and handwritten letters to school board members to city council members um, they're not going to get read by the president. He gets more mail than anyone has ever fathomed, and I don't know what's going on with their mail operation. They get tallied. But certainly to your House member, your member, your um, member of Congress in the House, uh, they, get, they do get pulled out, and um, they can be very short. Uh, we're talking shorter is good. In fact, results.org has a great um, a barometer that shows writing um, mm. writing a letter and it shows uh, sort of a needle of too long or too 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 vague mm -hmm. and then where you get to green and it's normally three or four sentences wow that's what we're talking about that's great to know so um, again we're talking mixing old-fashioned with the most novel and most innovative e-advocacy uh, mm -hmm. weapons that we have cool. at our disposal. Cool, thank you. Um, finally, I, I was just hoping to ask you to talk a little bit about School Girls Unite yeah, and, and um, how that started, how it's evolved, and the, the state of it now, and, and what it's meant to you personally. Okay, thank you. I love that chance. Uh, I um, was really depressed about the war in Iraq and just um, just felt like, you know, what, you know, it's really bad. And what could perhaps sort of change um, the um, incessant addiction we have to war, not just America, but um, so many countries. And I started reading about the impact of educating girls in the world and how in so many developing countries, um, the majority of girls don't go even to elementary school, let alone finish elementary school. And so half the population is not in a position to participate and be active citizens in their own countries. And I really do, do buy the stereotype that if we have more women in positions of power who might challenge priorities, how we spend money on health and education and uh, family um, and not military. Um, and perhaps have, again, falling into the stereotype that perhaps there will be more efforts and investment in conflict resolution, that, that we had a better shot at perhaps not having more um, um, occupations and imperialistic wars that are all about oil and power and land and and so that's my 60 year old idealism at work and I um, there were um, I was talking about this this learning um, about the importance of education of girls and sort of how the transformative uh, power of this in societies where girls really are property and so I met with a group of seventh grade girls and a couple mothers and some um, African women who all worked and were connected with our local neighborhood cafe. They were friends. Um, and I just was going to them with like, I'm crazy, what do you think? <laughs> I, you know, and so I, I just you know, gave them a few sort of, this is what I've learned, I'm outraged by this, and I was... And some of the African women, of course, said, yes, where when I grew up in Mali and in Cameroon, and yes, girls have no rights, that's why we live here, you know, and if I were living there, there would be no way I would be going to college or community college. And, and the young girls, these, they were 11, um, they were just dumbfounded that girls in many parts of the world um, are not anywhere close to having any kind of um, gender equality. And so we hatched uh, without a strategic plan, without money, um, School Girls Unite, uh, um, it was a very much a joint effort. The, these young middle school students came up with a logo um, 
and uh, worked on a name and uh, we worked because of the African women involved in this intergenerational um, effort. Um, they had connections to um, Mali and Mali is one of the fifth poorest countries in the world. It's a uh, and we sort of went through looking at the countries where girls have the worst um, opportunities um, and are the most oppressed. And Mali was one of those 15 countries. And we looked at Rwanda and other countries, but really wanted to look at a country that had a stable government and uh, was not just coming out of genocide, for example. And where also HIV wasn't the absolute assault on uh, so many children and that was an area where so much energy was going. Mm -hmm. And so our, these Mali women were able to connect us with a small nonprofit, non-governmental organization run completely by Mali, Malians. And they in turn engaged a group of young girls there and so we have a sister partner in Mali, and we're schoolgirlsunite.org. Basically, is is very small with sort of a hub in the D.C. metro area, and then a group of girls in the capital city of Mali, who are all city girls, educated, and are among the two percent who are actually enrolled in college. That's wow. all that go to college wow. in Mali. So. Most of the country is illiterate. Uh, so at the time of Timbuktu, which was the literary uh, hub, um, years and years ago now, it's uh, just, you know, illiteracy rules. And so we have, we do, we combine two things, which is philanthropy and political advocacy. And I find that to be a pretty potent combination because here we raise money to send on an ongoing year after year a total of 70 girls to school for as long as they stay in school in rural areas in Mali. And it's we're talking $70 a year uh, to send a girl to school that pays for her tuition. School is not free in Mali. One of the reasons girls don't go. Um, it pays for their school supplies, their books, and we also pay tutors. Uh, to help these girls stay in school. And so we raised the money and then our sisters in Mali, the girls who are in school in the city, they go to the rural areas and they run this scholarship program and they interface directly with these girls and their parents and the teachers and the mayor. Hmm. Um, and what they learn about, it's so hard to find teachers who have more than a elementary education who mm -hmm. are teaching in these schools. Mm -hmm. There are no latrines, so girls drop out when they get periods. Um, there's no water. The, mm. the, some of the girls desperately need food. They need a school lunch of some sort. They are so hungry to learn. Uh, malaria. They know, they learn all these problems. Mm. We're not solving them all by any means. We can't. But what they learn, they share their frustrations and some of the successes with the girls here. And that allows our, these young activists here to not just cite statistics, but to really be able to talk um, with uh, knowledge about the situation in our small case study. Mm -hmm. And so a very quick example is we have been uh, working with a coalition of groups very large international non-governmental organizations, but really one of the few youth-driven organizations on, a, on, a, on federal legislation called the International Protecting Girls by Preventing Child Marriage Act. 25,000 girls are forced into marriage through economics, through custom, through religion, and um, yes, we could be wrong on this, uh, but it's something where we need to, we believe, School Girls Unite believes, we need to be collecting data and having discussions about um, this human rights practice. And this legislation um, is very, it's, it's not an abstraction to us. Um, um, we, in our small scholarship program in Mali, three girls, all ages 11 and 12,
have become child brides. And um, their education has stopped. Um, our sister organization has managed to talk to the husband of one of the 12-year-old girls, Musa J. And he believes school is important. He has never been to school in his life. But somehow the city girls managed to not intimidate or come off as, oh, we know everything. Mm -hmm. And right now he has agreed to let his 12-year-old bride continue seventh grade. Um, that's, that's considered a success, um, I guess so. Um, but with that knowledge, we've been quite successful in working with Congress, mm. um, with particularly our, both of our senators and several House members, um, and being part of a, a coalition. And the, the legislation, this is the second Congress uh, that it's been defeated. Uh, we thought we had a, uh, a victory um, in late, in December of 2010. Um, we finally, the bill passed the House and then unanimously got through the Senate by quirky um, procedural things that worked to our favor. And then the House had to basically approve the Senate version because it was different from the original bill, which struck out any new funding. Um, and just streamlined it a little bit. And um, there was a, an 11th hour assault on the bill claiming that um, it would cost money. Uh, ultimately, it's possible it could cost money, but that was not in the bill, and there was no reason to kill it on those grounds, but that was the key argument they used, as well as claiming that perhaps this could open the door to abortion. And yes, what a terrible thought that a 12-year-old who's been forcibly raped by her much older husband, um, goodness, that would be the, the bigger issue than declaring child marriage a human rights violation. The bill, the main thing, would it would, the State Department puts out a human rights report on every country, including the USA, finally. It includes human trafficking and many other indicators. This legislation that just got defeated uh, would have included child marriage. Um, and that is, in many countries, including Mali, the legal age is 18. But the custom, and this would be true of Utah and, and the Mormon practices, right? I mean, this is a worldwide problem, and it needs worldwide attention because girls are, are pure property in this case, and they're really being exploited. So that, that is one of the issues School Girls Unite has been advocating for at the federal level, and we've also been involved in something called Education for All, which is part of the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, that by 2015 there would be universal basic education offered. And what is supposed to happen, all industrialized countries in 2000 took a pledge to the UN MDGs. And they're supposed to um, pledge a certain percentage of funds to make sure that uh, gender uh, equality in the classrooms, education for all, and then the other Millennium Development all goals, all those targets are met by the year 2015. They will not, but for example, the Scandinavian countries and even Italy have um, upped their percentage of funding for making sure that all girls and boys in the world um, at least get a basic we're talking primary elementary school mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is legislation setting up similar to a global fund for malaria, TB, and AIDS, a global fund for education to realize those, um, those UN MDG pledges that were made in 2000. But um, with the US um, situation in the Congress and um, a rollback on foreign aid spending, and it will be a very hard fight in the coming years. Well, thank you, Mom. Absolutely. For uh, sharing all your wisdom and passion. Thanks, Gordon. <laughs> thank you for your passion and wisdom <laughs> on many issues. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>